In this video, we're going to revisit the problem of the transverse vibrations of an Euler Bernoulli beam, only this time we're going to derive the equations of motion and boundary conditions using Hamilton's principle. Consider a slender beam with a distributed external load, we'll call this load F, and we'll assume that the beam has mass per unit length M and stiffness EI, and for simplicity's sake, we'll assume that both M and EI are constant. Length of the beam is L, and let's give it some coordinates. X and the displacement in the X direction is U, and Z and the transverse displacement in that direction is W. In the previous video, and a link to that appears above if you need to review it, we determined that the kinetic energy for an Euler-Bernoulli beam could be written as the integral from 0 to L of 1 half mv squared, where v in this case is w dot dx. This is the translational kinetic energy, and we also explained in the previous video that for an Euler-Bernoulli beam, the rotational kinetic energy is negligible and can be ignored. We also showed that the strain for an Euler-Bernoulli beam can be written as the integral from 0 to L of 1 half EIW, XX squared dx, where 1 half EIW, XX squared is fundamentally the moment times the curvature of the beam and is the work done by the internal stresses. And then finally, the external work, let's do this in another color, red, uh, external work is equal to the integral from 0 to L of the force times the displacement, so F times W dx. And now we have all the pieces we need to proceed, so we start by writing down Hamilton's principle, which states that the integral from T1 to T2 of the variation of L dt is equal to zero, where L is equal to the Lagrangian. This is Hamilton's principle, and from this, as we showed in a previous video, we can write the integral from T1 to T2 of the variation of the kinetic energy T minus the variation of the strain energy U plus the variation of the external work dt. And that is equal to zero. Let's give these some numbers. One, two, three, four, and five. Okay, so we need to proceed by taking the variation of the kinetic and potential energy and work expressions. And I just want to remind you in terms of the calculus of variations, that the kinetic energy T is a function of W dot, which in turn is a function of time. I remind you that we don't take the variation of the independent variable, in this case T, but only of the dependent variables. So just by inspection you should be able to see that the variation of the kinetic energy is equal to M W dot del W dot. Let me write it out on the next page and perhaps it will be clearer. So from equation 1, we can say that the integral from t1 to t2 of the variation of t, dt, is equal to the integral from t1 to t2, the integral from 0 to L, of m w dot del w dot. So I took the derivative with respect to w dot, the partial derivative, and in doing so the 2 cancelled the half, and I'm left with m w dot del w dot dx dt. And I can rewrite this by switching the order of integration as the integral from 0 to L, the integral from T1 to T2, of m w dot del w dot dt dx. So now what do we do? We want to remove the derivative from the del w dot. What do we do to do that? We integrate it by parts. So this term needs to be integrated by parts. And in doing so, we can then rewrite this as the integral from T1 to T2 of the variation of the kinetic energy dt is equal to the integral from 0 to L of... So now we have the boundary terms, which I get by writing this down but removing the dot. So that's equal to mw dot del w from T1 to T2. And I remind you that fundamental to Hamilton's principle is the fact that the variation of the displacement, in this case w, is zero at both t1 and t2. So this boundary term falls away completely. And we're left with minus the integral from t1 to t2 of, now we put the derivative here, mw double dot del w dt, and then we need a dx. Let's put a yellow box around this intermediate solution, and we'll number it six. We can do a similar treatment with equation 2. The integral from t1 to t2 of the variation of u dt is equal to the integral from t1 to t2, the integral from 0 to L, 
of e i w comma x x del w comma x x d x d t. So again, a reminder that we've just taken the derivative of this functional with respect to w comma x x, and that's what gives us this part times del w comma x x. All right. So again, what do we need to do since we've got a derivative here? In this case, we've got a second derivative. So what you should be thinking is to get this to del w comma x, we've got to integrate by parts once, but then we've got to integrate by parts a second time to get it to del w. So in this case, we've got to integrate by parts twice. This is equal to the integral from t1 to t2, open curly brackets, of the boundary term, which is just this, times this with one of the derivatives removed. So e i w comma x x, del w comma x at zero and l minus, don't forget the minus sign, integral from zero to l, and now I've got to put the derivative onto this term, and considering e i is constant, it's just e i w comma x x x, del w comma x dx, close curly brackets dt. So what we've done is we've removed one of these x's. Now we need to integrate just this term a second time by parts in order to remove the remaining derivative. So putting it all together, the integral from t1 to t2 of the variation of u del u dt is equal to the integral from t1 to t2 of e i w comma x x del w comma x. This is the original term. We haven't touched it minus, there's now a minus in front, so this boundary term has a minus e i w comma x x del w, we've just removed the derivative, at zero and l. Now we flip the sign again, because it's a negative of this negative, so we have a positive integral from zero to l, and now we've got to take another derivative, e i is constant, so e i w comma x x x, one more x, fourth x, del w dx, close braces dt. That's a mouthful, but that is the variation of the strain energy, and it's now in its strong form because we don't have a derivative here. Let's give this a number, number seven we're up to, and put a yellow box around it. All right, so the only thing left to do is the variation of the external work. This is from equation three, and the integral from t1 to t2 of the variation of the external work, dt, is equal to the integral from t1 to t2, the integral from 0 to L of f, and w just becomes del w, dx dt. Equation 8, and put a yellow box around that. So then finally, returning to equation 5, and we now have it all color-coded, we can substitute 6, 7, and 8 back into equation 5, and then I'm going to group all the terms under the integral from 0 to L, such that I can write it as the integral from t1 to t2 open curly brackets, the integral from zero to L, and then each of the components, minus M W double dot, minus E I W comma X, 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 plus F, all of these multiply del W DX, and then I've got to include the boundary terms. The only ones that survive come from the strain energy. The first is minus E I W comma X, X, del W comma X at zero and L, plus the second one, e i w comma x x x del w at zero and l, close curly brackets dt, and all of that must be equal to zero. Now it can be shown, I'm, I'm not going to do it in this video, you just have to take my word for it, that for this to hold, each of these terms, this one, this boundary term, and this boundary term, must go to zero individually. Again, I'm not going to show it in this video, you can take my word for it, but each of these terms in this equation has to go to zero independently. We'll call this equation nine, and then let me just add some notes. So this equation is equal to zero. Why? Because del W is arbitrary. This is the fundamental lemma of calculus of variations, that because del W is arbitrary, therefore this is equal to zero. This is where the Euler-Lagrange equations came from, only we never previously saw the case of a second derivative, in this case W comma XX. As a result, we had to integrate by parts twice. And then similarly, each of the boundary terms will equal zero independently. This, which is in fact the Euler-Lagrange equation, gives you your equations of motion, and your other two are your boundary conditions.
Let's look at this a little more closely on the next page, and I think it will become more clear. The equations of motion can be rewritten by taking a couple of terms to the other side as mw double dot plus eiw comma xxxx is equal to f. Call this equation 10 and put a red box around it. And you should recognize this as exactly the same equation of motion that we derived in a previous video using Newton's second law. I'll leave it to you to decide which one was easier, but uh, I remind you that this is a very simple problem, and where these energy methods come into their own are as the problems become more complex. That's straightforward enough. Let's look at the boundary conditions, and I remind you that we weren't given any boundary conditions in this problem, but the interesting part is that the boundary conditions come out of Hamilton's principle. So this is the first boundary condition that says e i w comma x x del w comma x at zero and at l equals zero, and what we can deduce from that is that at x equals zero or l, either this must be equal to zero or this must be equal to zero, one of the two. So therefore, either e i w comma x x equals zero, the moment is equal to zero, which implies that w comma x x is equal to zero, which is the curvature or del w comma x equals zero, the, the variation of w comma x equals zero, which means that w comma x is specified. Yeah, let's put a couple red boxes around these, and I remind you this first condition, w comma x x equals zero, is what we call the natural boundary condition, and the other one, w comma x being specified, would be a geometric boundary condition. Let's give these some numbers, 11, 12, and 13. Let me put a dividing line here so that I can put the second set of boundary conditions on the same page. The second boundary condition is that e i w comma x x x del w at zero and l is equal to zero. We'll call this number 14. And then we proceed in exactly the same manner. So at x equals zero and l, either e i w comma x x x is equal to zero, which means the shear force is equal to zero, or del w is equal to zero, which means that w at either x equals zero or l must be specified. We'll call that equation 15 and 16. And I remind you the first one is the natural boundary condition where the shear is equal to zero, and the second is the geometric boundary condition. Boxes around it and we are done. Let's just run through this again very quickly from the beginning since I know this is new to a lot of you. What we did is we used the expressions from a previous video for the kinetic and strain energy and the external work, we applied it to Hamilton's principle by taking the variation of each. Then I showed you, I color coded it to show you how each part contributed. And the key here was to integrate by parts. Every time we found a variation here that wasn't in terms of W specifically, it was some sort of derivative of W. Same thing happened here. We found a derivative of W. In each case to remove the derivative, we integrated by parts once or twice. The work was dead simple. It's force times the virtual displacement is equal to the virtual work. Plug it into Hamilton's principle, group like terms, and then everything under the integral sign from zero to L, that becomes your equation of motion, and the boundary terms become your boundary conditions. In this case, the boundary conditions are very simple. The videos will look at more exotic boundary conditions. That's all I want to say about this video. I hope you found something useful in it. If you have, please go ahead and smash those like buttons so others can get to see it too. If you have any questions, comments, or other feedback for me, I'd love to hear about it in the comment section below. If you wish to be notified of future video releases, please click on the subscribe button and hit the bell next to it. The notes from this lecture are available for download. The link to that appears in the description below. Thank you for watching, and I will catch up with you in the next video.